Rich, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Oh, I'm uh, very honored and pleased to do it. Thank you. Please let me read a short introduction of you uh, for those in our global audience who may not be aware of you and your contributions to the profession. Dr. Richard E. Mayer is an educational psychologist from the University of Michigan, best known for research and contributions to the field of educational psychology, especially his multimedia learning theory, that optimal learning occurs when visual and verbal materials are presented together simultaneously. He was the recipient of the E.L. Thorndike Award in 2000 for career achievement in educational psychology and the 2008 Distinguished Contribution to Applications of Psychology to Education and Training Award from the American Psychological Association. He is the author of more than 600 publications, including 35 books on education and multimedia. And he has been ranked number one as the most productive educational psychologist in the world. I read some time back that you are the most cited author in our field. Dr. Mayer is professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he has served since 1975. Dr. Mayer, before we get into our three questions, let's begin with this. What do you think of the current state of the L&D profession? I, I think um, it's an extremely important profession and that um, we are really making great progress in being able to take a scientific evidence-based approach to, um, to the design of, well, multimedia instruction, remote instruction, whatever we want to call it. And I think the general public has um, recognized an increased appreciation for what we do because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the need for remote learning is kind of drawn attention to the importance of um, at least this, this aspect of, of what we do of um, computer-based instruction. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited and optimistic for the, for the future because I think we have um, useful theories for how to build instruction and we have evidence-based principles that you know, are not laws that are um, kind of um, put in stone, but give us some idea of how to design things based on evidence. Um, so I think we're making great progress and I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Well, that, that's a really, of course, long, <laughs> long list because yeah, I think there's always a lag between um, when research comes out and when it gets applied. And I think, you know, the, the people who are, are putting it into practice have to filter through and see what really, what, what really has an impact. I mean, a lot of the research that I do is in a lab, you know, with a pretty restricted population. So it's not 100% um positive that that's going to actually work in the real world so i do think there's always some kind of a lag and some kind of a filtering that goes on um but i think you know some of the earlier research that our, um uh, our field's been involved in is what i would call techniques for reducing extraneous processing so these are things we can do in instructional design to um uh, kind of weed out the material that doesn't need to be there and just focus in on the important material. And I think that's one of the original instructional goals in like my, my theory of multimedia learning. That was kind of the first one that was studied a lot. We know a lot of how to do that, but I still see a lot of instruction that has a lot of extraneous bells and whistles on it that don't support the instructional goal. So, you know, some of those techniques for, um, uh, reducing extraneous processing would be things like I uh, have uh, it's one principle called the coherence principle, which means uh, ex we should exclude extraneous materials. So, having lots of pretty graphics that are not really supporting the instructional goal, or um, lots of things going on on the screen, let's say that really aren't um, supporting the goal, those are all that's extraneous, and that that's going to detract from learning. So sometimes I do see more 
more stuff on the screen than really needs to be there. Um, and some of the other principles along those lines are signaling, which involve, or cueing, which involves kind of highlighting the important information, because we don't want people to have to be searching around the screen or trying to figure out what you're talking about. It should be obvious where to look. Sometimes I see that's, that signaling principle is not being followed. Um, redundancy is another principle. Um, this involves having printed words on the bottom of the screen at the same time um, when we have a voice saying those words. That's kind of distracting. We just need the voice generally. We don't need the text at the bottom unless we're working with an audience that um, um, is um, working in their second language or there's lots of technical terms or something like that. And the last one kind of a principle along those lines is what I would call spatial contiguity. This means that printed words should be next to the part of the graphic they're talking about rather than um, at the bottom, let's say, as a caption. Okay. Um, well, you know, there are a lot of um, um, new technologies, and I think people kind of think that we need all kinds of new rules for the new technologies. We've been studying learning in virtual reality, for example, for the last, dec uh, last two decades, I guess. Um, and I would say the same basic principles that apply to learning from text or learning from um, just a basic presentation, uh, a lot of the same principles apply to learning with uh, a medium like virtual reality. There are some differences, of course, but um, I think it's not the medium that's really causing learning. It's the instructional method that causes learning. So the same instructional methods that are effective um, with other media, I think, are also effective with new media like virtual reality, or we also have been studying using games to try and train cognitive skills or uh, content. And I think the same principles apply there. So some of the some of the findings, let me think. Um, some of the more recent ones are what I would call emotional design. This is the idea that the emotional tone of the presentation actually affects learning. I, I'm more of a cognitive psychologist. I focus more on just the cognitive side of learning, but there's also an affective side. And we know, for example, if the instructor displays positive emotion through voice and through gesture, people actually recognize that. They recognize that the instructor is positive. They themselves feel more positive. They feel the instructor is supporting them more. And they also actually learn more. So we know the emotional tone of a presentation can have an effect. So we can call that the emotional design principle. Um, we also know kind of basic things like um, in a demonstration video like you see on YouTube, uh, they're just typically filmed from a third person perspective. You know, somebody sets up the camera and shows how you, you know, fix a bicycle um, tire or something. Um, we, research kind of shows that a first person perspective would be more effective. So having the camera kind of on the shoulder, on, you know, on your shoulder as you're doing something or over your head with a, um, is a more effective than a third person view. So when we have, let's say, a presentation, um, let's say even a, power, uh, a presentation where you have graphics and a speaker, um, the typical way to do this is to have slides or to have the graphics already made and you just refer to them. But our research shows that Having the instructor actually draw as she lectures uh, is more effective than having her stand there next to the already drawn graphic and talk about it. A couple other ones are um, embodiment. Um, this, this has to do with just the um, instructor using human-like gesture, or this could also uh, involve an on-screen character, animated pedagogical agent, for example. If that agent or that human uses more human-like gesture, facial expression, um, eye gaze, those all are important aspects of the instructional message that have been overlooked, I think, in the past, but have a, uh, an impact on learning works. Uh, having more outward gestures and pointing gestures helps people learn better. Mm -hmm. What else? And, and the last one I would say would be uh, personalization, which means 
using conversational language rather than formal language um, to express um, ideas helps people learn better. It makes them feel like the instructor is trying to work with them and cares about them more. Yeah, that's so interesting. There are there are a lot of, of interesting myths that people have had. One battle I've had over the years is, is um, the idea that discovery methods are are the most effective. Um, that's a idea that I think a lot of people have been taught, and we all think, yeah, activity is good, hands on hands on activity is good, discussion, doing things, but. Um, most of the research shows that a kind of pure discovery approach to learning is not very effective for at least um, inexperienced learners. So if we're working with people that don't have a lot of prior knowledge, then a pure discovery approach where we just kind of give them things to do and let them try and figure it out on their own uh, has been shown to be pretty ineffective. People need a lot of guidance. Um, they need a lot of help. They need a lot of advice, scaffolding. There's lots of words for this, but um, um, I think sometimes people think less guidance is better and I'm more, my research and I think the research in the field shows that people need a lot of guidance um, and instruction uh, even when they're doing something hands-on. So I think that's one myth that, um, discover, that discovery is an effective method. Mm, what else? Uh, another one is realism. Some people think the more realistic things look, the, the better it is. Um, so if we're going to have graphics, they should be as realistic as possible. Maybe virtual reality would be good because that feeling of immersion would make it feel more real. Um, but the research seems to show that, you know, too much realism can actually be distracting. Um, Sometimes just a line drawing can be more helpful than a really photorealistic graphic of what we're talking about. Kind of depends on the instructional goal, of course. And the same thing applies to learning in virtual reality. Some of our research shows that people learn better from a PowerPoint presentation than um, immersive experience because the immersive experience is so overwhelming, people lose, lose track of the main point of the lesson is um, learning style. Um, this is a very popular idea that um, we should adapt instruction to people's learning styles. So verbal learners should get verbal instruction, visual learners should get visual instruction. Um, I, I think the overwhelming consensus in the research community is that that's not a helpful idea, that there's not re research support for, the idea, for that idea, although it's an extremely popular idea in education and in, um, um, in development of, of training materials. Um, I think good instruction that uses words and graphics together is more effective for everybody. <laughs> um, so um, having just verbal or just visual instruction is probably not a good idea.